right. We are in Acts chapter 9 this morning, Acts chapter 9 and 10. God prepares Peter for greater ministry. You know, God has to do attitude adjustments in us. We're going to see that happen in Peter today. He's going to get an attitude adjustment. And in the end, we're going to find out that maybe we too uh, need some attitude adjustments as well. So let us pray, and then I'll give you a really neat uh, beginning story, and we'll get into this this great uh, this great time when God preparing Peter for greater ministry. Let us pray, Father. Thank you so much for your blessing already this morning. Uh, truly, it's it's great to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, what a joy to, to, to leave the house and come down to the house of the Lord and to be together with God's people. So we ask now that you would be with us in a powerful way. Speak to our hearts. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me right now that, that what comes forth from here is from you. It's from God. It's from our great Savior and not from a preacher. We, want, we would see Jesus here this morning. And so we ask you for your help and your blessing and your direction as we look at this wonderful, wonderful passage of Scripture. We give you praise, give you thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Niccolo Paganini, the greatest violinist of all time, stood before a packed house surrounded by a full orchestra. He played a number of different pieces, then he came to his favorite, which was a violin concerto. Shortly after he was underway, one of the strings broke. It snapped on his violin. Relying on his genius, he improvised and played on the next three strings. Shortly thereafter, a second string snapped on his instrument. He again began to improvise and continue playing the piece. Almost at the end of his magnificent violin concerto, a third string snapped. Amazingly, he finished the piece on one string. The audience stood to its feet and applauded until their hands were numb. They assumed the concert was over. But Paganini proceeded to play an encore with full orchestra. He made more music on one string than many could ever make on four. Paganini took what appeared to be a most difficult situation and turned it into a triumph. His attitude made all the difference in the world. I can see people playing like that and one string snaps, they take their violin and throw it down and walk off stage. No, this, this guy, he just kept on going. No matter what we're pursuing in our life, no matter what field we are in, music, athletics, education, business, homemaking, or politics, attitude is the key. It's the attitude that is the key. Nowhere is this more important than in our spiritual lives. What's our attitude going to be as believers today? It is possible for dynamic events to occur in our lives only to have them neutralized by a wrong attitude about something or someone. Our perceptions and misconceptions, what we view as possible and impossible, our prejudices or lack of them make all the difference in the world. I want us to be thinking on this today and for the rest of our lives. What's your attitude going to be? Now here's Peter. This was Peter. And uh, it, it might be you today as well. Peter starts out with well-intentioned spiritual pursuits, but they were full of self 
sufficient presumptions. Let me walk out on the water with you, Lord Jesus. I will die with you. I will never forsake you, Lord. Well, Peter sank to the bottom, didn't he? Sank to the bottom. Yes, he did. And he denies Jesus three times before the cross. That really, that really sent him to the bottom. But Peter grew quickly as he learned firsthand the emptiness of fleshly dependence and the necessity of being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Peter was still not perfect. One of his biggest flaws was his attitude towards the Gentiles. His attitude toward the Gentiles. In today's terms, they would call him a racist, right? That's what it would be called today. Yes, indeed. You know, Peter was like Jonah. I'm not going to those Ninevites. Nope, not doing that. That didn't turn out too well for a good while. And even in the end, Jonah still had issues and still had problems. We don't even know what the end of that story as far as his attitude is concerned. Hmm, what a shame. It was hard for Peter to get this. Jesus' commission was to the whole world. You take the gospel to the whole world. And Peter's like, no, I don't think so. The Jewish people, fine. The whole world, uh, not so much. So now here we are. We're six years down the road after the church started this morning here in Acts chapter 9 and 10. Six years down the road. And the church has remained pretty much a Jewish church. Peter's attitude could have strangled his ministry and held back the great commission of Christ. But you know our God, he wasn't going to let that happen. That's not going to happen. Peter had to develop a proper attitude towards the world. This text is also speaking to us this morning. The stakes are high. How we look at those all around us is very critical in our lives. Point number one this morning, Peter is prepared by personal experience. Peter is prepared by personal experience. Uh, chapter 9, verses 32 to 43. Acts chapter 9. We're taking a lot of verses here this morning. Uh, we're looking at Acts 9 right now, verses 32 through 43. And it came to pass as Peter passed through all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. There he found a certain man named Aeneas which had kept his bed eight years. He was sick. He was a quadriplegic. He was sick of the palsy for eight years. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And now look, look at this. And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron, saw him and turned to the Lord. I love that word all. All that dwelt there turned to the Lord. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. Whom, when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and 
all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed. And turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called, the saints and widows presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. So Peter has two very positive ministry experiences that helped to change his attitude. The first one is the healing of Aeneas, eight years on his back, quadriplegic. Peter went to Lydda, now called Lod, the present site of the Tel Aviv airport. Wow, Peter had no clue there would be jet planes coming into there. Peter ran into him, and, and, and uh, he was called by God to say, pack up your bed and walk. Pack that thing up and let's go. This was a powerful miracle. You know, today our parents tell their kids to get up and make their beds with not much success. We're talking about a powerful miracle. Maybe parents would think that would be a powerful miracle too. The result, everybody gets saved. How'd you like that? Wow, everybody in Carlisle got saved. Wouldn't that be something? Wow. Then we have the second miracle in verses 36 to 42. We we'll go now to a seaside town of Joppa, 10 miles away. A lady named Tabitha in the Hebrew, which means gazelle, as does the Greek name Dorcas, which we mostly uh, call her. And there are many ladies named Dorcas on this planet. She had made all these garments for the people. I mean, she was a professional, professional seamstress and gave of herself. And, and suddenly she gets sick and she dies. I mean, that is bad news. That's really bad. So they send for Peter. And he gets there and he says, Tabitha, Arise, again, many believe in Jesus Christ. So now Peter has had two very, very positive ministry experiences back to back. And this greatly factors into his attitude adjustment towards the world. As both experiences were with Jews, but they were in Gentile areas. God is working in Peter's heart. Both of these miracles were very similar to miracles that Jesus himself had already done. Jesus told of the paralytic at uh, Bethesda to pack up your bed and walk. Same deal. And Jesus raised the daughter of Jairus from the dead. And Peter was there and he saw it. And on this day, he does the very same thing that the Lord Jesus Christ did when he walked on this earth. God is softening Peter. His prejudices are beginning to weaken. Positive experience can go a long way in rearranging our attitudes, getting them fixed. Positive experiences. You know, on the basketball court, just a few quick baskets can change the momentum of the game. I remember telling this story. I don't know how many times I've told it. But up in Bloomsburg, many years ago, we were there for the Final Four basketball in the Keystone Christian Education Association. And the championship game was being played in the first half. 
In the first half, the one team was up by 35 points. I thought this is over. Let's just hand out the trophy right now. Well, I'll tell you something. I was mistaken. I was so mistaken. That other team came out of that locker room in this, after the second half, and they began to claw their way back into that game, and they ended up winning the game. I'm thinking to myself, how would you like to be on that team that was up by 35 and you lost? What was that like? I can see them at halftime, man. They were hooping and hollering, man, we got this thing, man. We are, we are cleaning house here today. You know, overconfidence is a bad thing. It happens all the time in sports, and they end up losing the game. Just some good things happening can change the attitude. Change the attitude. That's all it takes. A few quick baskets and we are back in this thing. The next thing that God does is to get Peter to Simon a tanner. So the Lord Jesus takes Peter and hooks him up with somebody that Peter would never want to spend any time with. Why would I want to go to this tanner's place of business? That's anathema to a Jew. I mean, it's a highly unpleasant place. It's stinky. They're slaughtering animals all the time. Tanners were ostracized. They had to live 50 cubits outside of town. If you're a tanner in the Jewish community, you get away from us. <laughs> we don't want you anywhere close. And so this tanner loved Jesus. And so Peter was willing to spend time with him. God is at work changing Peter's heart, changing his attitude. It is changing. If we are willing to learn, God will change our attitude. Point number two this morning. Point number two. Peter is changed by personal revelation. Peter is changed by personal revelation. This happens in chapter 10, verses 1 to 23. Let's just begin with the first two verses of chapter 10. There's a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian Band, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Now, I like this story a lot because we're talking about a soldier here, a soldier, a centurion, a great soldier. The centurions did most of the work in the Roman armies. They were the backbone of the Roman legion. They commanded anywhere from 300 to 600 men. Cornelius was searching for God, and he's attempting to do the right things in his life. Yes, he's a sinner, and he is lost. He was a noble, and he was a spiritually-minded Roman army officer who was longing for the true God. And I've said this many times, anyone who was longing for the true God, God's going to get someone there. If you're longing for the true God, God's going to get somebody there. In response to his deep longings, God met him in a vision. Look at verses 3, 4, 5, and 6, 3 to 6. He, Cornelius, saw a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day. Three o'clock. An angel of God coming into him and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now, send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. 
he lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. So what happens? Well, Cornelius is a soldier. So what is, he flies into action. Verses 7 and 8. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. This guy was a great centurion. And when he had declared all things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. Then God prepares Peter's heart for this upcoming experience. Now God is going to do some more work in the heart of Peter. We'll read the rest of the, the story, or as far as we're going to go today, verses 9 through 23. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. It's noon, it's lunchtime, and he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance, and he saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air and there came a voice to him rise peter kill and eat but peter said not so lord for i have never never eaten anything that is common or unclean and the voice spake unto him again the second time what god hath cleansed that call not thou common this was done thrice and the vessel was received up again into heaven now while peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean behold the men were sent from Cornelius, had made inquiry for Simon's house, and stood before the gate, and called, and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, said to him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore you are come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. You know what really, really is striking as we read these verses is the orchestration of God. I mean, God just lays it out. Boom, 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 boom. Done. You ever watched God do that in your life? Have you ever sat and looked back over your life and watched how, how God orchestrated things in your life? Have you ever looked back and seen how God protected you from things? Maybe protected you from the wrong person? protected you from marrying the wrong individual have you ever thought about that have you ever thought about how he has worked in your job place in your family's lives have you ever thought about how god has orchestrated things and right down the line there it is you know what an awesome god we have and right here god is orchestrating an attitude change in peter an attitude change in Peter, God is making it happen. It's a powerful thing. 
So Peter has a problem with this sheep. And all these animals that were unclean, he didn't like the buffet of unclean animals. Didn't like that. So I thought about a sheet for me full of Brussels sprouts. The only thing they're good for is wiffle ball bat practice. Now I know some of you love them, and that's great, but... So the four corners of this sheet in his vision correspond to the four points on a compass, north, south, east, and west, the sheet represents the swarming, for us today, billions of people on the face of this earth that Peter says, I'm not going to them. Oh, no, no, no. Mm -mm. Well, you know what? This sheet included Cornelius and his household and his devout soldiers and everybody else on the planet. So, Peter, as we read, was really struggling with this. He is really struggling. But once he got it, he never forgot it. Never forgot it. Peter's attitude changed. It had to. It had to change. Think about us sitting here this morning and worshiping God together and looking at this story. We're here today... Because we were on that sheet somewhere. And without a change in apostolic attitudes, not just Peter's, but without a change in apostolic attitudes, we would have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ because they wouldn't have taken it to the Gentiles. God changed their attitude and they said, all right, we get it, we're going to go. And they did it. And thank God they did. Peter responded to that heavenly vision. And all of a sudden, here those men were to get him. Wow, God is working. He obeyed the Lord and his attitude changed on that day. Now, I don't think that there's one single person here this morning that does not want the entire world to hear the gospel. I would say that 100% of us want the whole world to hear the gospel and to become born again. For each of us, though, there probably are some attitudes that need to be changed. Our response to God needs to be, I'm listening I understand what you are saying to me. I need to get with your program. Help me to change my attitude. So what I want us to do as we're winding down, we're going to be closing up here very, very soon. But what I want us all to do here this morning is we're, we're all going to get our own four-cornered white sheet. Okay? We all have our own four-cornered white sheet. On that sheet right now in your heart, in your mind, write the names of people that you dislike. Write the names of people who have wronged you. Write the names of people who have offended you. Put them on that sheet right now. Do you need to change your attitude about those people? I'll tell you how we know we do is because in our minds and our hearts, the devil has us rehashing these people over and over and we think about it. That person did that to me. That person said this. That person should have done that. And we think about it. And so we need to take that sheet and consider those names. And we need to commit those names to the Lord Jesus Christ right now. And we need to ask him to help us to love those individuals and to change our attitude about those individuals. So we, have, we all have our sheet. We have our, the names written on there. 
Now I'm going to pray a prayer. And I'm going to ask all of us here to pray this prayer about those individuals that we have written on that white sheet. Let us all bow our heads together. And if you want to make this good with God, you pray this prayer along with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I confess my wrong attitudes about certain people. Help me to forgive them and to love them. Those that have hurt me, those that I consider to be beneath me, I confess that I too am the worst of sinners. May your grace burst through my walls of pride, and may your love conquer my self-centeredness, so that in me and in them, your name will be magnified. In Jesus' name we pray.